Hi everyone, welcome back to another Federal Law Enforcement Training Center's Leadership Institute uh, Leadership Series. I'm George Belsky, I'm a senior instructor here at the Leadership Institute. My guest today is George Zamka, Colonel, United States Marine Corps, retired, former NASA astronaut. Correct. Um, George and I have known each other for a very long time, have been good friends since probably the fall of 82. That's it. And uh, he was a junior at the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. I was a junior at the United States Military Academy at West Point. And uh, he happened to be an exchange student for a semester. We wound up in the same company and pretty much been friends ever since. So uh, I'm excited to, to have him here because he's had a interesting career, which I will just highlight. And I'm going to ask George to go into a little detail on. So graduated from the Naval Academy, 1984, Dean's List in Mathematics. Yes. Uh, goes into the Marine Corps upon commissioning, chooses Marine Aviation, fighter pilot, Navy or Air Force Test Pilot School, NASA astronaut, two space shuttle missions, one as a pilot, one as a commander, L retired as a colonel, went to work for the FAA, um, Oh, stayed at NASA as a civilian and then transferred over to the FAA as a uh, senior executive service member uh, and then fully retired. Now you're in private service. Um, I, I keep waiting, George, uh, for you to do something with your life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting to grow up, too. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, again, thanks for thanks for being here. Um, a really, really interesting career. And I, I want to expand on, on various parts of it and then tie it into our leadership stuff uh, as we go along. So why the Naval Academy? Um, I'd say it goes back to a, a field trip in seventh grade to Washington, D.C. that had a, a side uh, trip over to uh, uh, Annapolis. Um, and uh, while there, we went to the uh, museum and I had an aha moment. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but it's it's the one moment I can point to. And that was uh, in the museum. They had a porthole from the USS Maine that was in there. Uh, and um, before then, I was uh, living in New York City until I was 12. And we'd go to West Point quite a bit. And so I was familiar with West Point, familiar with... Um, seeing the cadets run around there. So I think a seed was already planted about uh, service in the armed forces. And uh, in seventh grade, we'd been studying uh, history and uh, had just heard about uh, Teddy Roosevelt and San Juan Hill. And uh, seeing that porthole all seemed to crystallize it where I said, hey, people of consequence come from this place. Mm. And uh, that's, that's where the... Uh, the spark was lit, I guess, and uh, I, I wouldn't have been able to verbalize it back then. But I think at the time I wanted to be among um, my icons, my heroes, and um, and that that's what planted that seed, and that's what eventually got me uh, in pursuit of that, and, and uh, got me was into a uh, naval cabin. Nice. At West Point later. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting, and uh, you know, as, as a a product of the the West Point environment. And you're a product of the Naval Academy environment. Um, not only are they extremely uh, good academic schools, they're leadership factories. Um, and we may not have noticed it as, as juniors in college, but um, going back to the Naval Academy, did leadership, uh, was leadership different at West Point? in your exposure to it than what you experienced at the Naval Academy, or were they pretty similar in their approach to developing character, developing that personal sense of honor and, and staying on to, to duty uh, as that? Or was was it the same or a little different? Uh, the same and maybe different in, mm. in one regard. Uh, uh, the same in that both you, you call them leadership uh, factories. I think of them as leadership sandboxes. You know, you, you take a bunch of young people 
give them some rules to follow. Some are reasonable, some less so. If I'm remembering that little <laughs> card thing on the door, uh, <laughs> no, no, no opinion there, or no, no uh, judgment there on the uh, uh, Liberty card. But uh, the one thing we had at Navy uh, that I think might be surprising is we had um, a lot of the former POWs that would be in in the orbit. The superintendent of the Naval Academy was uh, Vice Admiral Bill Lawrence. Uh, he was very close to being selected as an astronaut early on, and, and uh, wow. got uh, ended up going to uh, to Vietnam, got shot down, and was was a prisoner of war there. And we had some of the other kind of the luminaries from there. And uh, when I talk about being heroes, th- these are folks that uh, you can actually see what they went through. And so from that, and from from their example. Uh, I, we got um, a bit of an education in resistance. Mm. Uh, when you're under uh, <clears throat> con- situations that you can't control, particularly your prisoner of war, and, and uh, uh, there's a threat of you being used for propaganda and, and that kind of thing, um, being an honorable person uh, and being true to your, your peer group was superior to any rank or position that you had. So uh, I won't say that was exclusive to Navy, but that's certainly what one thing that they uh, um, kind of embedded in me without me even knowing it. Uh, right. you know, don't don't be a jerk. It doesn't matter where you fit on the org chart or how many uh, uh, bars or uh, oak leaves you have or anything else. You you just be loyal to to your peer group and, and the folks that uh, you work with. And Interesting. Good. Yeah. So uh, upon graduation, chose. Marine Corps aviation. What was the drive behind that versus naval aviation? So two steps there. First was the Marine Corps, part. right? Uh, and I think I'd always kind of been ground oriented, you know, since uh, you know I had the interest in West Point and went there as the exchange student in my uh, junior year. Um, but uh, I, I have to uh, credit this to uh, the the Marine cadre of officers uh, that was at the Naval Academy. Uh, they are pretty stellar individuals, uh, and there was one in particular who was, uh, uh, to me, he was almost not of this world. I mean, his his, his uniform was always perfect. His bearing was uh, always, um, I, I won't say distracted, but uh, uh, you know, my relative noise level and those of my peers were kind of high, you know, high energy guys, and he just managed to just uh, maintain uh, a, a deliberate. Uh, strict demeanor. Uh, he was friendly once he thought you were kind of a serious person. And in there, there was a challenge because he kind of kept talking with me, even though at that time I didn't take myself very seriously and, and consider my, you know, I was, I was kind of a college guy, you know, so I, I had my foibles. Um, but he didn't give up on me. But at one point, I, and I, I can't remember what it was he did exactly, but he almost intimated like, you can't hack this. You can't hack the Marine Corps. Um, and uh, I think in, you know exactly what he's doing. And he was just putting that little chip right on my shoulder. <laughs> and I was like, okay, uh, uh, yeah, let's go. And so that's what got me into the Marine Corps. And then uh, on the aviation side for me, it was, uh, yeah, I, I had envisioned being a pilot. I wanted to be challenged by that. And uh, my physical held up my, a lot of it's luck. Um, but uh, all my uh, my eyes held up and, and all the other things I looked at. And so I kind of, uh, I won't say I stumbled into it. It goes back to my early uh, early goals. I, I had an uncle who was a pilot. And then, you know, there was the astronaut thing that was looming there that, that I held as a possibility. So that's what got me into the, the air side of the Marines. Nice. And test pilot seemed like a, a natural progression after your, your various tours. Because you started in, in fighters flying A6s. And then transition to F-18s. Is that right? Yeah, I want to be. I want to be a purist, and because I'm, someone may catch it. So the A-6 was the, the A stood for attack. So uh, didn't didn't have a gun. It was meant to. Uh, it's an offensive weapon. So uh, we, it's meant to uh, attack targets. Go go downtown, uh, and then also uh, for the Marines, we used it for close air support for for uh, Marines in contact uh, in all weather. That was its specialty back. Not so special now with GPS and global mapping and all that <laughs> stuff. Back then, it, it uh, uh, and I remember flying missions where I couldn't see outside the cockpit at all. It'd just be totally white, and we'd be using our radar and then my little display to fly through uh, 
uh, canyons and, uh, and that kind of stuff. And so, um, and then later into, uh, fighters, uh, and then in my fighter squadron, the F-18 squadron, I had two test pilots and they were both very sharp individuals, Don, Don Borgi and John Ryder. Uh, and they, um, seem to understand the airplane a layer deeper than I did. Uh, and, uh, I just like their demeanor. They, 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 uh, they're always questioning. They're always very positive folks, but always questioning. And they seem to be go-to people. And I, I like being that go-to kind of guy. And so, um, from them, I found out what test pilot school is and what test pilots do. And that they're essentially the bridge between engineering and operators or the ones that, um, uh, take an airplane and test it to make sure it meets the operator's requirements. And then if there are any tweaks that have to be made or recommendations that they, they catch that. Uh, and so they have a hand in the final product that goes, goes to the operator. So I signed up for that. And it wasn't until I was in test pilot school that the astronaut thing came back because one of my, I went to the Air Force uh, test pilot school. One of my Air Force classmates came up and he goes, hey, did you apply to be an astronaut yet? And uh, yeah. Do what? <laughs> it goes, yeah, we all did. You know, I look and they're all smiling and uh, I was like, oh gosh, I had no idea you could even do it. And they said, yeah, you, you can do it because they, they need, um, they like test pilot school graduates because every space flight really is a test flight. There's so yeah. few of them and there's always something new in every flight. So they like that, that test pilot, uh, uh, knowledge and, um, uh, competency, uh, in, in, in those, uh, cockpits while they're doing that. So, I applied. It took me a couple times, uh, uh, and uh, that's how I ended up at NASA. And how long were you in NASA? For just shy of fifteen years. Okay. From uh, ninety-eight to uh, to thirteen. Okay, and two shuttle missions. Two shuttle missions, right? Uh, One is uh, was ST one twenty as the pilot, and then ST one thirty as the as the commander. Commander, yeah. And that, that NASA parlance is is a little different in that the uh, commander, the term commander is actually the one who's the, not only command of the mission, but uh, also doing the majority of the flying on, on the flight. Oh. As a pilot, uh, really, there is some flying. There's uh, There were sticks in both uh, both sides of the, uh, of the shuttle cockpit, but really uh, the pilot was more of a flight engineer. Uh, but that being said, um, the training for that was pretty tough because a lot of the systems were hard and they... Uh, uh, we worked the uh, electrical system, the uh, hydraulic system, the reaction control system, and some of these were complex in the way they failed and in the way you had to uh, diagnose the failure and then reconfigure them to to operate safely. So that was a challenge being in that seat. And the commander was a was a separate challenge. We had to kind of open your scope up, and, and uh, you were in charge of everything that happened uh, on that mission. So uh, two different mission sets. Yeah, super interesting. Um, Wow, I mean, we'd spend an hour just talking about that, but I want to, um, I want to cover, um, cover some of your more leadership stuff. Um, were there any particular lessons at the Naval Academy that you learned that you were able to cling to your entire career? Were there some leader, some really either hard learned or, or you know, just things, leadership lessons that became internalized that you were able to use start to finish in your career? I think so. The The first one is is the, uh, what I mentioned about the former POWs uh, and uh, from their example that they set just by being there and what they infused into the the culture and, and how that translated down to us. So um, from that, a lot of leadership is just setting the example, being what it is you want your people to emulate. Uh, and uh, and that was a key thing. One of the things that, you know, just, just to put a negative in there, um, and you, you may remember this also, did you have RHIP? Did oh, yeah. That? Okay. All Rank right. half its privileges. Rank half its privilege. And, and fortunately, I haven't heard that in a long time. But, but at the time, that was one of the reef point little, you had to know what that little acronym meant. And uh, unfortunately, that also embedded itself and, and that uh, uh, the idea of privilege that, uh, you know, because you had a certain rank, you could get to the head of the line or you didn't have to do certain nasty jobs. Uh, it really served more than anything else to pull pull teams apart, you know, separate mm. 
ranks and, and folks in different positions. And uh, I, I don't believe they teach that anymore. What, what you would do now, it's all service, servant-based leadership. So, uh, for instance, on uh, my first flight, uh, NASA flight, uh, part of my pilot jobs was I was the head toilet engineer. <laughs> So, so you never you never get past being a head toilet engineer, I guess. In my job. But you know, certainly in in, in the Marines and the in the Army and uh, in the Navy, you've got those jobs where you got to deal with all that stuff. Uh, and during my time at NASA, I, I in doing that on that particular flight, we actually had some, the toilet break something something broke on it, and I had to work on it. And um, we realized what an important piece of equipment that was. I mean, that is, that is no, it's not just comfort. It is health and welfare. That yeah. is, that is the crew staying healthy and being able to finish the mission. And, uh, so, uh, that was viewed as a very important job, you know, uh, and that was a job for the rookie, but, uh, exceedingly important. And when I was doing my repair, I, you know, got offers of, Hey, can I help you with this? What do you need? And, and, uh, so, um, that's, I, I think the most poignant example of, Hey, you know, doesn't matter what job someone has, you be true to that person and you respect them because they're probably doing something. They're doing something that you rely on uh, to go well. And so um, uh, that's something that I that I drew on. I think after, uh, but uh, I, I think, um, and this is just me spitballing. You know, we came on active duty after graduation at a time when they were really rebuilding the military post. Vietnam. And I think a lot of our mentors, guides, coaches, at, at least at, at my level, you know, battalion commander and, and above had all been either platoon leaders, platoon commanders in the Marine Corps or company commanders in Vietnam. And so they were trying to take some of those older lessons of RHIP and really really putting them in the place they were. And so, you know, it was always related to me uh, as a junior officer uh, or and a, and a company grade, you know, officer as a captain that, hey, man, here's what your privileges are with your rank is that everybody comes before you. The mission is more important than you. Your subordinates are more important than you. You will eat last. You will. So they they kind of kept RH. IP, but flipped it on its head so it was more servant oriented based on the things they had maybe seen fail uh, when they were junior officers. And I, I think that may be where we start that evolution. I, I should do the research and find that out, but that's just me pontificating at that's that good. point. That's a, that's a good spitball. So in, in our brief points, our, our would you all call it the West Point? The, the little book of oh, uh, yeah. facts uh, you had to Bugle memorize. Notes. Bugle Notes. Yeah. yeah, so you had to memorize it and then you'd, you'd be asked and had to recite the knowledge uh, when asked for. So RHIP was right next to RHIR, which the rank has its responsibilities and, yeah. and, and those two were balanced. I think um, the RHIP for a bunch of young guys, unless unless it was put in the term that that uh, you did, you know, guys, guys and ladies, um, could be confusing. And um, when I got it, I remember thinking of it as kind of noise. Say, this doesn't really help me with anything. So <laughs> it was. I was just wondering why I was in the book at all. You know, why? Right. Was Interesting. Yeah. So after um, now, you you spent time as fighter pilot and then you had a like a ground based assignment what was that it was a ford air controller um and they uh these days they call them jtacs <clears throat> but uh the marines had that i think going all the way back to the korean war but the idea was to have a pilot on the ground who uh, had a sense of what um the ground looks like from the air as a means of calling in airstrikes so uh you know, the, the classic example is if you can say, hey, do you see a red roof? Uh, and the pilot would say, yeah, I see about a thousand of them. <laughs> and so you, you would need know how to talk to a pilot to get their eyes on the particular target and then learn how to give briefs and uh, how to uh, how to manage uh, airplanes as they arrived and they departed and, and all that. So that, that's what I was doing while I was there. Uh, but I was doing that as part of a, a infantry battalion, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, that later uh, joined the 31st Marine Expeditionary Unit. So this is a regiment-sized um, 
unit in the Marine Corps that has a ground combat element, an air combat element, and a force service group as well. So it's kind of like a little self-sustained um, regiment uh, in air right, with its own air and uh, and supplies. And uh, I think it's good for 30 days. I forget what the exact uh, doctrine was, but it, it's a pretty potent little little package. And that's what I was. I was, I was there with those guys. The difference was... Uh, in terms of my leadership uh, uh, experience uh, while I was there was when I was with the squad and I was with largely with a bunch of peers. These were folks that were learning from each other. We're competing with each other a little bit. Uh, we're watching each other's backs. You know, we're, we're switching, switching roles. Some days you're flight lead, some days, you know, you're dash four. Um, uh, but in either case, you're building a your reputation there with the uh, the infantry battalion, there are a lot of brand new young Marines. They're 18, 19, and there's a lot of them. And uh, they're always listening and uh, always watching. And uh, you have to do right by those guys. So you had to be uh, more deliberate about uh, how you carried yourself and, and what you said and, and uh, uh, how you spoke to them because you don't want to give any, any, uh, uh, anyone a, a bum steer. An example was whenever we did uh, an exercise, and this was all in training. Uh, one thing that we had to learn how to give, and this this is probably like several generations uh, past from what, what they how they do it now. Something called a confirmation brief. So you had to explain what the mission was about in the hangar deck of the ship, so that every PFC understood exactly what their role was and what it was they were supposed to do on this mission. And uh, the way they'd follow up on that is they'd have an evaluator go and grab one of these PFCs and say, what are you doing on this mission? And if they didn't have a decent answer, that wasn't their fault. That was your fault. Uh, so that that was uh, a, a key distinction between that and the squadron where we've all been through flight training and have all had some kind of base level um, of training so that there's an assumption of what it is we know. And, and uh, you can kind of brief to the higher level instead of briefing so completely yeah when we when we teach um leadership and go over those uh excellent practices the the one that almost always rises to the top is the leader's ability to communicate and um it's not just what we say or what we send in an email or what we say on the phone or what we text it's you know what time do you show up from work what time do you leave from work who who does the leader go to lunch with who does the leader not go to lunch with? Those are all communications. And, you know, I've learned over uh, through my military and law enforcement career, you you can kind of fool um, your junior folks probably for about five, 10 minutes. And then they start to figure out who you are and what you're about and, and how you're really communicating. So when you had talked earlier about being able to set that example it's it's not just in are you competent uh in what you do but you know are you a leader of character will you do what you say you're gonna do and and that's an interesting um you know i think all leader experiences along those lines are like they have an aha moment that oh yeah somebody's somebody's really paying attention to what i'm Absolutely. doing yeah. and 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 how important that really is Let's make the transition from leadership in the Marine Corps to leadership in NASA. What was that like? Yeah, so at NASA, um, the astronauts that uh, I got to be with were uh, were fantastic. I mean, they they were smart. They were operationally very astute, very capable. Uh, we had the uh, the best pilots out of all the services that were there, um, and then uh, the uh, the engineers and scientists that were there were also very smart. They, they just came from these, uh, you know, highly technical fields and were superb. So uh, I really had to step up my game. And uh, as a matter of fact, when I got assigned to be the commander of a mission, uh, I was, uh, there was one rookie and then I only had one space flight behind me. And so uh, there were a couple of others that had uh, other space flights um, as well. So they were senior to me really. And, and, uh, uh, in the in the space uh, realm, uh, so uh, what I did was, uh, and and this works for like a high performance team. I think uh, 
I, I did an inventory, kind of informal. It's not like I gave him a form, but hey, you know, what, what's your background? What have you done before? Uh, what do you like to do? And in my mind, I was trying to create roles for these people. Now, in, in some ways, they were assigned to fulfill certain roles, but there are all kinds of tasks that have to, have to happen on a space shuttle mission. You have to uh, have a, a way to prepare the shuttle from once you're in orbit to have it ready for orbit operations. At the end of the mission, you have to do the reverse. You have to uh, put everything away and, and uh, reconfigure the shuttle for reentry into the uh, uh, into the atmosphere. Uh, you have to be organized for the the different missions that you uh, have while you're up on orbit. So uh, I would talk to these different uh, folks and find out what it is that they like to do, and then I gave them a purposeful mission and a purposeful role <clears throat> where they could each stand out a little bit, and then I give them give them the right recognition. And, uh, you know, I wasn't uh, clumsy about it. I, I, I would uh, try to make this uh, kind of evident as they went along, like, hey, you know, I, I, I did that. I did a nice job there and these folks helped. And so um, that way I was able to get the individuals performing to their maximum. And then uh, the thought was when, when you have a team, uh, it always does better when everyone works together. Well, if everyone's happy with what they're doing, they're better working together. And now you have the... Uh, and the whole is greater than the, uh, the sum of its parts uh, on, on that team. And uh, I think that worked pretty well. We always uh, talk about one of the first things uh, a leader has to do is know themselves. You can't really lead anybody else until you know yourself and, and can lead yourself. Um, what were some of the tricks you learned uh, along the way that helped you know yourself to improve uh, your own performance so you can improve uh, the performance of other folks. Yeah, very, very good. So uh, NASA is a very strong debrief culture. Uh, and when you, uh, you know, since you can't practice in space, uh, you know, you only fly in space to do the mission, we practice in simulators. And these, these simulations uh, involve <clears throat> in excess of 100 people. You, you not only have the crew, but you have the the flight control room team that's there, and then they have their back rooms. And then you have the instructors who help. Um, they write the scripts for how a particular run is going to go. And um, they're targeting different things. They're targeting the reactions of, of, of the whole room, or sometimes they're picking on it, particular individuals who they think may have a weakness. So uh, whenever the run would end, um, there'd be an opportunity for a debrief. And, and I would always debrief my own errors. One is because I was most keen to those, you know, I, I could have observed those, but I also wanted to, to show a little humility um, because from humility, you learn, uh, you know, particularly we're all seeking to be excellent. Uh, and uh, unless you are willing to, uh, uh, to accept that you are not as good as you think you are, uh, you're not going to get there. And um, matter of fact, one of the things that I, I did early on when I realized hey, I had to step up my game and I was just making mistakes, a lot of mistakes that I, I didn't know about was I, uh, I kept a diary called the uh, Dumb Things I Did Diary. <laughs> so uh, every time I, I did something in the sim that uh, was uh, a mistake, some of them were more embarrassing than others. Uh, there, there was one where I did basically an outside loop in the shuttle uh, trying to come back to the, uh, the Kennedy Space Center for a return to launch site scenario. Uh, and it was because I was misinterpreting the... Uh, the degrees on our little attitude indicator. Uh, and I was waiting to go to uh, 60 and I ended up uh, hunting for it and, and ended up doing this loop with the shuttle <laughs> hunting for it. Uh, and, you know, I, I wrote that down as painful as that was, I wrote that down and I got to study. It's like, why did I make that mistake? You know, and why does it seem only I made that mistake? Uh, and what I found is that a lot of mistakes that I make are unique to me. I, I, I have a construct that's from years of experience and education and biases that uh, would lead me to fail in my own way. And I think that applies to every human being. Every human being is different in, in how they succeed, how they manage to succeed, but also how they fail. So if you can mitigate the downside by knowing you know, what your failure modes are, uh, and that's what I was seeking to do in my case. I didn't think it like that in depth, but that's what I was trying to do is mitigate my own downsides. Then that from there, I could I could step up and, and be better. The, the Stoics tell us that uh, be humble or you will be humbled. Sure. Uh, and that 
that o- I've always found that to be uh, <laughs> at least true in my case. Right, right. Right. Whenever you think, hey, man, I'm at the top of my game, that that's when uh, you get that sharp little, yeah, maybe maybe not so much as you think. Can we stick on the humility thing? Yeah, just please. For, just Absolutely. I think it's, it's a, a major leader trait. Mm-hmm. One story uh, I, I want to tell was uh, when we were brand new astronaut candidates, uh, we got a visit from Neil Armstrong. Uh, and he came as a special favor to someone who was still there. And uh, we're very excited about him coming. And uh, the thing that we were fascinated about is, is the Apollo 11 landing. And uh, for those that, that don't know, uh, they, uh, that landing was very dramatic. First landing on the moon, they kept having computer failures. These were like little rickety computers back in those days, nothing like what we have here. Uh, and they kept getting the major fault where essentially they had to reboot the entire computer as they're like falling towards the moon uh, to, uh, to get it up and running. And uh, when he arrived at his intended landing point when they did, and he was flying at the controls, um, realized it was boulder strobe. And there were boulders there. They could not land there. Ugh. So he had to abort the landing and then hunt for a place to land. So that when he finally shut down, he only had six seconds of fuel left. Uh, and uh, so pretty amazing story. I wanted to hear about that. I wanted to hear him tell that story, but he didn't. Uh <laughs> He went through uh, an hour and a half, and he, he was a professor at uh, Purdue. And so he he talked about aero engineering, and he drew free body diagrams, which is an aero engineering thing, you know, uh, uh, lift, um, gravity, there wasn't any thrust there, but essentially what the different forces were. And he talked about uh, blunt bodies and why the uh, shuttle, for instance, is not a pointy object when it reenters. It is more of a blunt object. Why? You know, the Mercury and Gemini capsules came in bottom first. You know, those were very blunt. It wasn't like a, you know, spear going through. And, you know, how come they, they did that and explain the reason is it pushes the shock wave off the skin of the, uh, the vehicle and the way they call itself said it's cooler. Anyway, he talked to us for about an hour and a half. We're like, <laughs> you know, and uh, he knew what was going on. So, uh, it, Fascinating. So at the end, he, he looked at his watch. He goes, okay, so it's been an hour and a half. And uh, I have not talked to you all about the one thing you probably wanted me to talk about. Uh, and that is that I wanted to tell you that I feel better uh, and more proud of the work that I just described than my own luck at being a, in a certain spot on the flight schedule. Wow. Yeah. So if there was ever a guy, you know, who could beat his chest, you know, the first man, first human being on the moon and didn't, uh, that guy set the bar up here for humility. Wow. And, and so uh, uh, that was the example that, that uh, I had at NASA. I was like, man, I got to live up to that. That's, yeah. Pretty rarefied air. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. So, um, You know, when we teach uh, crisis leadership here at the, the, the Leadership Institute, we surround it around uh, four pillars, uh, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, and decision making. Undergirding those are uh, the leader's emotional intelligence to be able to navigate through whatever crisis may be. And then, of course, the leader's resilience. Uh, to be able to to handle crises that may stack up on each other, especially in a in a in a law enforcement environment, critical incident, whatever that may be. Now, you had talked about uh, at least on one of your uh, shuttle missions, you wound up having to do an unplanned uh, spacewalk. Uh, was that as a result of? a crisis that occurred and you guys need to work through that. And what, what does crisis leadership on a, on a space shuttle look like? Right. Right. And I, I don't know if I could check all the boxes that you, that you mentioned, uh, but to, to set the stage. <clears throat> so this was SDS 120 and I didn't do the spacewalk. Let me, let me say that outright. I, I was, uh, did the robotics and I also did the, uh, 
uh, the the video recording of it, making sure the right cameras in the right spots to catch everything. And um, and I also I did have a significant part that I'll, I'll talk about here in a minute. But to, to set the stage, um, one of our uh, mission objectives was to reposition a solar array. It was the very first solar array that was on the space station. It was old. It was the oldest that was there. Uh, and it had on a prior mission been folded up, kind of like you'd fold up an old highway map, accordioned in, asked and left, left there for uh, a few months. And then we were to take our, the robotic arm, move it out to the end of the truss. So take it from the top of the space station, move it out all the way out to the side, expand the solar array part so that it can now function in its new location. We were uh, briefed of something that could happen, which is where as the array was expanding again or being extended, the panels could stick to each other. And uh, we were uh, taught how, well, we positioned our cameras to catch that so that we would stop the extension, kind of let it sit for a while, get, get some sun on it, let whatever was causing it to stick bake off, and then extend it. Um, we had a... Uh, event where the sun passed through one of the cameras in exactly the wrong spot in exactly the wrong time. And so by the time the uh, the sun had passed through, there was already a tear in the solar oh. array. So that was, that was the event. Um, now, we couldn't extend the array all the way. We couldn't put it back. Uh, and we couldn't leave in the shuttle because that there was no structural knowledge of how that structure would accept, you know, the shuttle back in a way and using its reaction control jets. So, so we're kind of stuck. And, uh, the, uh, NASA uh, all the way back to the Apollo days has had this thing called uh, flight control team four, which is a, uh, it, it's a, a team. There are three flight control teams. The first three covered the 24 hour shift. It's an eight hour shift that uh, covers the mission flight control team four is on call for a contingency like that. So they, they would be called in and they were called in to work on this problem. Uh, and while they worked on the ground, uh, we gradually, uh, you know, we did other tasks, but uh, kind of got prepared for whatever it was they might be asking us to do. Um, I'll say that uh, our commander on that flight, Pam Alroy, she's now the number two person at NASA, uh, was totally involved from, from the, uh, the get-go. She kind of put herself in the forefront of anything that was going to happen uh, subsequent to include that spacewalk. Um, the way the uh, flight control team four worked was they, and I think this is a good method, they would break into small teams to do problem solving. One of the teams identified the means by which we could repair the solar array. They had no idea. They weren't expecting this to happen. Uh, so uh, th that team came up with the idea of uh, building what they called a cufflink, but it essentially was a stitch uh, about between, I'd say, four and six feet long. And there were five of them that would uh, go into pre-manufactured holes in those arrays. They, they weren't intended to be used in space, but there they were. And you could stick them in one side and stick them in the other side and then bridge the tension across them, across the torn area. Uh, so that you could extend the ray out. So they came up with that idea. They had another flight control team that came up with the uh, robotics. Another one that came up with uh, the, the plan to insulate the spacesuit so that um, the uh, astronaut inside, Scott Berezinski, wouldn't get electrocuted uh, because the arrays were hot, 160 <laughs> volts, direct current, and he had metal wrist rings. So how, how do we keep him safe? How do we keep him from contacting the array that he had needed to do surgery on? So they came up with that plan wow. and the robotics was, how do we even get them out there? Because this was now all the way out. It was an unplanned, as you say, all the way out at the end of the, uh, the array to do that, uh, to, to get out there and make that repair. And the array was very flimsy and it would be moving around on him. He's trying to work on it. So, uh, so we had that, uh, I think it, uh, on the fourth day, we actually conducted the, uh, uh, the spacewalk. Scott was out there. It was a very unselfish team. He had, uh, Doug Wheelock, who, uh, Army uh, West Point yeah. guy, class 83, that was out there right. with him. And his job was to observe the array as Scott was working on it to make sure that it didn't come up against him and contact him without Scott knowing. So in him being out there, he had to be in his spacesuit where he was alternating between the, the plus 200 degrees Fahrenheit and then the minus 200 degrees. And he spent a lot of time in the minus 200 degrees because of the time of year that we were at. And, and oh. he just ran out of heat to crank in that suit. So didn't know this until like later uh, post-flight, but he was out there 
freezing and still uh, helping Scott out. And uh, we had other folks that helped with the robotics. So uh, in summary, what I saw, um, uh, preparation, you know, having a team ready to, to deal with this. Uh, leadership was absolutely important. You know, um, uh, Pambo uh, stepped right out there and, and she took over the IVA role, which is the uh, intravehicle, essentially being the procedural reader, running the spacewalk, choreographing it from the inside of the, uh, the shuttle, uh, along working with the, uh, the ground uh, flight uh, control team. Um, my role was to build those cufflinks. Uh, and uh, I did that in, in my small team was myself and the commander of the space station, which was uh, Peggy Whitson. So there you had a very senior astronaut paired with a relatively junior one. I was the, the rookie on that flight at the, at the time uh, to build these uh, cufflinks, make sure they, they had to be within a quarter inch of the correct length and they had to be insulated and everything had to be machined to a certain degree. And we used uh, materials um based on the Apollo 13 incident, where we had billets of aluminum to make parts of. We uh, we had uh, wire, we had clamps. So we had all the, instead of like using a sweat sock or something like they had to use there, <laughs> we had materials to be able to build these kind of things. They didn't plan on us building that, but they had a stock of that stuff up on the space station we didn't work from. So uh, preparation, leadership, teamwork, um, that's uh, that's how we got through that one. Yeah, I think, I think, but... I think you hit all four of those pillars with communication between both NASA on the ground, the team members uh, on both the space station and a shuttle that are with you, the collaboration of the various teams that are putting this, this problem together, certainly the critical thinking aspect of, well, how do we solve this problem we didn't really foresee? Uh, and then the decision making, okay, this is what we're going to do and, and this is how we implement it. So I think, uh, and, and I think, the the resilience angle is there. I, I don't think there's any group on the planet uh, that's more prepared for the resilience angle than than, than a NASA astronaut. I, I you know that's a that's a good point. And the, and the way we did that, and it was deliberate, and I appreciate it. We kept it light the whole time this was happening. You know, I just mentioned this. Hey, this can happen to Scott. We kept it light, and he was first and foremost doing that as well. He was the senior spacewalker, and, and uh, we, you know we'd always crack jokes, you know, play little tricks on each other, just 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 to not get heavy inside the space shuttle, contemplating what it was that the, the situation they were in, and what yeah. we'd have to do get at, to get out of it. So um, that was that was where the resilience came from. It was from you know just making sure that we all kind of stayed on our game and, and didn't start worrying and, you know, uh, fretting about things that might happen. Um, we, we were, uh, we were pretty light through wow. that whole thing. Yeah. That, oh, amazing. Um, so an incredible career, right? From Naval Academy, Marine Corps, Marine, uh, do you guys call yourselves aviators or pilots? Aviators. Marine Corps aviator, right. fighter pilot, because I'm going to throw it out because that just sounds cool, right? Test pilot, um, NASA astronaut, two, two space shuttle missions, right? Um, were there any lessons, uh, and, and I go back to um, Stephen Wright, the comedian, says experience is that thing you get right after you really needed it, right? Or Oscar Wilde would say, experience is the name we give to our mistakes. Were there, were there leadership lessons you, you would have liked to have learned prior to, ha to execution? Are there, are there any that stick out over time? Um, yeah, probably the, uh, the biggest one like the recurring theme during my whole time would be um, the uh, awareness of the value of taking time to not be reactive, but to be deliberate, uh, to deliberate about what you do uh, in the face of something that emerges, uh, a, uh, something that happens to you. Um, in the uh, uh, airplane, it, it would be, uh, you know, an in-flight emergency of some kind, engine fire, um, electrical short, that, that kind of thing. Um, uh, in not being reactive, but taking time to think about what it is you're going to do, making sure that you've got the proper indications of that. And, I, and I, NASA really drilled this into me, make sure that we had such complicated ways of reading 
what was actually going on. We had to step through and actually verbalize what it was that we were seeing either, you know, a series of lights on the caution panel or, uh, you know, volts uh, going a certain way um, uh, and taking that time. So the aviation uh, term for that is slow hands in the cockpit. Mm. I'd say the ground analog is slow, is smooth, is fast. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's either those two are the same thing, just uh, for for uh, different mantras. Um, the uh, anytime something happens, and, and I imagine it, it happens in law enforcement, you, you will get put into uh, adverse situations. Uh, you may or may not have planned it or expected it, uh, but uh, being able to have a pre-planned reaction so that you can do that, you can switch from reactive to deliberate. Uh, is an important thing. Um, in my travels, I got to meet a relief pitcher, a, a major league relief pitcher. And uh, I was always fascinated in this. So a relief pitcher never shows up at a good time. Right? <laughs> he's, he's not, yeah. not walking, hey, just, you know, ice this guy and uh, we go home. It's always, uh, you know, hey, bases is loaded. You got zero outs or, you know, one out maybe, and you got to pitch your way out of this. So, um, I asked, and he was a very good one. Uh, I just uh, say any, any questions, and I and I said, prefaced it with what I just told you, and uh, I said, "What do you do? When you, what is on your mind when you step up and you're in that situation? What's your reaction?" And uh, he looked at me and he said, "Just breathe, brother." And uh, at first, I thought, "Well, that's kind of a flip answer." <laughs> But really, there was sheer genius in that. He was absolutely right. And, and what, what he meant was uh, his deliberate move for that was to take a deep breath. And uh, so if you can get to a point where you, you, know, you feel it bubbling up, and this is the em emotional intelligence, so I don't like that term, but it's really your amygdala, as I've studied this, it's your amygdala, a very tiny part of your brain that's filtering all these inputs and stimuli and getting in, you into fight or flight mode, not thinking mode, fight or flight mode, uh, and getting you to a reactive situation that these days is probably not the right one. Um, but by taking that deep breath, sucking one in for four seconds and holding it, you suddenly get oxygen back into the brain. And at the one time you really need to be able to think and, and uh, evaluate your situation, you can do that. So this has been a slow burn of a learning process for me uh, over over my decades and i i had some uh awareness of it coming along but in terms of like just knowing it succinctly it took me a long time to get there yeah we know uh from study and use of force um and when the sympathetic nervous system engages and we go into that fight or flight mode we know that under moderate amounts of stress uh, we lose access to the prefrontal cortex part of our brain where we do our rational critical thinking and we start to work more on that amygdala and we're emotionally driven and how do we stop that you know at the exact place when you need that how do you get that and you know preparation over time training so we we do repetitive realistic training over and over and over again so that it just becomes one more rep it's not oh my gosh look what I, it's like yeah been here before we've done that so it keeps us out of that but realizing when you're getting to that spot and then being able to re-engage the parasympathetic nervous system which is your body's break to give you that space between stimulus and response where you can make a better decision absolutely is that take a breath right you know in for four hold it for four let it out for four and then pause at the bottom for four that um, box breathing, what, whatever, whatever form you want to call it. Yeah, absolutely. And that never goes away, whether you are tactically engaged or strategically engaged as a leader, being able to take that breath and say, okay, what, what's really happening? Excellent. Yeah. 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 And it, it happens in the office. You know, if you, you know, if <laughs> somebody's pushing all your wrong buttons, they, they may not even know they're doing it. Right. Uh, but uh, being able, you know, you can be taken right to that spot 95% of the way there. But if you can find a way to back out of it, and for me, it's just, you know, take that four second inhale. Uh, that is enough of a pause to uh, start 
being in charge of yourself again. So, yeah. Um, another uh, lesson I learned uh, was uh, trusting your team. Mm. Um, so I talked about the simulations and, and how those went. And, and there were uh, just a, a little bit more about them. We had these script writers that would actually write these scenarios. And um, when I go into the simulator, I could ask the, uh, the instructors that were in the, the sim room, the sim control room, I'd say, hey, what's this? And they'd say, oh, it's a, uh, um, this is going to be a, a FIDO run. Or they'd say, oh, it's a GPS run. So they were saying they were going to test the skills and preparation of, of certain control desks. But if they ever said, well, this is just a, a generic run. And I was like, <laughs> they're coming after me. <laughs> they're just not telling me. So anytime I heard that, I, I know that they were coming after one of the dumb things I did and see if I, you know, if I got that worked out yet, you know, and, right. and, and I've got that checked. So all that is a preface to say awful lot of training, awful lot of preparation uh, for a mission. On my second flight, my commander mission, um, we went out to uh, the launch pad, and uh, this is abort night. We did not go that night because of weather, but uh, went out there, and it was a night launch. <clears throat> Looked at the space shuttle on the pad. We do that. We ride the, you know, walk up the walk out the same ramp and the same doors as the Apollo guys did. Get in the little uh, Astro van, which has got the had. <clears throat> burnt orange uh thick pile carpet and then just uh <laughs> you know, it wasn't that great inside but uh you know it served the purpose you know and you could you could hook up cooling in there and go for on the long ride down the kennedy space center to the launch pad which was empty most times it would be bustling with uh you had to get by security there were there were, there was security around the pad and there were people bustling around you know probably about 100 or more people around the pad doing their tasks when you go for launch day uh, or launch night, um, the pad is empty. The gates are open. Uh, there's nobody there. The last human being we saw that was not us was uh, in an armored personnel vehicle about three miles back, and he was in one of those flame retardant suits, and he was going to be the guy that came get us if if, uh, if he had to. Uh, and then the uh, the shuttle itself was at that time fueled, uh, and the, the fuel is uh, cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen, so it's it's very cold and it is shrinking the tank. So the tank itself is creaking and kind of moaning uh, as it's up there. There are ventilators going. And because the tank is so cold, it has its own weather system. So there's vapor and clouds around it and there's condensation that's dropping off the bottom of the tank. So it's kind of this eerie scene. Uh, so we got out of the van and I looked up at the uh, space shuttle. Again, it's my first commander flight. Uh, and I looked at the two windows that were at the top of the shuttle that I would be looking through to affect the rendezvous with the space station. I would be flying. This would be hand flying the, the actual rendezvous. And, um, and then I looked at the uh, uh, the gantry that went into the shuttle. And, and for some reason in my mind, uh, I I remember the feel. It's like, oh, man, I'm going there. Uh, I was thinking just absolute dread. I thought if once I go into that shuttle, I'm not going to come out until I'm either a hero or a goat. Uh, if something messes up on that mission, it's going to be on me. And, and if I mess it up, you know, if I mess up the landing, if I mess up the rendezvous, you know, that's what started. It was the, looking at those two windows. And uh, I, I, I couldn't shake it. I just had this miserable feeling riding the elevator and getting in the shuttle and um, sitting there and, and uh, just having, a, I guess, a, a, a crisis, a confidence crisis as the countdown went down. And, you know, again, trying to keep it light and, and all that stuff. But inside, I didn't feel ready. Uh, they aborted for weather, and as soon as they called the abort, I looked out the window and I could see the launch chart. I go, man, I have got to figure this out. <clears throat> I got to get right. And uh, the way I got there was I thought back on all the training that I did, where even though I hadn't done this complete mission, I had done all the parts of it at least 10 times. And not only had I done it at least 10 times, but I'd had all these hundreds of people looking at me. And then all the way up through the chain of command of NASA, people had to sign off on my readiness. So people were signing, putting their professional careers on the line, saying, yeah, George Hamka's ready for this mission. He's ready for commander, signing all the way up to the head of NASA. So I thought, man, if I can't trust those guys, I'm, mm. I am messed up. So um, that's where I, I learned um, the value of trusting your team. Trust your team. Yeah, so, and not just not just the team members you're leading, but the team you're working for, yeah, that's that's 
Excellent. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great, that's a great story on, on, on emphasizing that. Well, George, I could stay here all day talking to you, but, uh, I'm going to let you go. Uh, would you ever like to come back? Oh, to talk to you? Yeah. Yeah. Anytime. Yeah. Right. That'd Absolutely. be great. I'm going to, I'm going to see if we can do a part two. We'll do a deep dive on some of this stuff. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for, for taking time out of your day to, to share your experiences with us. Um, you know, you've been a friend of mine for a long, long time, probably almost 40 years now. And, uh, but just, uh, you're a great human being, man. Great American. And uh, I appreciate everything you've done, brother. Well, thanks, appreciate George. It. It's, it's, it's a real pleasure and it's an honor to be here talking to the uh, men and women of law enforcement. And uh, thank you very much for what you do. And uh, I, I hope you enjoy this. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk again. Excellent. All right. We'll see you, everybody. We'll give you advertisements on uh, when we'll do our next leadership series. Thank you.